Bibles tonight to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 36, we want to talk on this subject, conquering your crisis, conquering your crisis. You came to church tonight to get a word from God, and he has one for you, Isaiah chapter 36, it's in the 18th chapter of the book of Luke. The Bible says that Jesus was telling a parable. And the reason he was telling that parable in Luke 18, he wanted to show something. He wanted to illustrate something. That at all times, all times, good times, bad times, up times, down times, narrow times, wide times, happy times, sad times. At all times, all times, men, people, Ought, it's a moral obligation, it's a privilege, ought to pray and not to lose heart. You ought to keep praying. It ought to be a part of your life. Just pray, pray, pray. When it's convenient, pray. When it's inconvenient, pray. If you don't want it, you say, well, I don't feel like praying. Well, pray until you do feel like praying. I don't believe God's listening to my prayers. Well, pray until you know he's listening to your prayers. Pray Pray, pray. Jesus says, I can't say that enough. And he said there was a man in a certain city. He was a judge, and he didn't fear God, and he didn't respect men. And there was a widow in that city, Jesus said, and she kept coming to him saying, give me protection from my opponent. Obviously, there was some, some legal uh, situation here where this rich and powerful man was, was trying to take advantage of this poor widow. She's a nothing. She has, she has no money. She has no legal representation. She has no power. She has no standing. And, and, and she was coming to the judge and says, I need some help. This guy is taking me for everything, and, and there's, there's not going to be any left. And I need some help. I need somebody to defend me. And he said, finally, after a while, he did not fear God. Jesus made sure they remembered that. He did not fear God. He did not respect man. He didn't love God. He didn't love people. He only loved himself. He said, this widow bothers me. I will make give her legal protection unless she continually comes and wears me out. And then Jesus says, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Now shall not God bring about justice for his elect, that's you and me, who cry to him day and night, men ought to always pray, who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith, literally faithfulness on the earth? Listen to that. When the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes, will there be anybody trusting him? Will there be anybody praying? Jesus is talking about prayer. It's the engine that makes life eternity work. Without it, you're dead in the water. Without it, you have no rudder. It's the rudder that gives you direction in your life. You ought to pray, Jesus said. You need to pray, Jesus said. You have the privilege to pray, Jesus says. You have the power to pray, Jesus says. You have the moral obligation to pray. That word, word ought is a strong word. You, you have the necessity to pray. If you could see what I see, Jesus says, you'd be praying night and day. Day, a strong word. I tell you, though, Jesus says, 
He will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is coming again, and his Holy Spirit is already here. But when he does, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus said that. I didn't say that. Jesus will come. Jesus will bring judgment. Uh, Jesus will bring justice. God does answer prayer. Will he find faithfulness? Will he find persuading faith, urging faith, confident faith? What a challenge. What a challenge God is giving us today. What does Jesus mean? He, he says uh, there are things that are going to get so out of hand, it's going to cost you a lot. And it will be difficult for you to even say anything about Jesus. And, and all you will do, like your pastor reminded you last Sunday, will be able to do is just groan and say, Oh, God, help me. It will be so bad that most will lose heart and will quit spreading the faith. Do you believe that? Do you believe that prayer makes a difference? I'm not talking about somebody out there. I'm talking about you and me. Do you believe prayer makes a difference. Do you believe your prayer makes a difference? Jesus didn't say believe in prayer. Jesus said believe in the God you pray to. Even if no one else is praying, will you pray? I want to talk to you tonight about crisis. I mean gut-wrenching, life-threatening crisis. We're not talking about inconvenience. Uh, we're not talking about you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas. We're not talking about somebody hurt your feelings. We're talking about genuine, life-changing, death-bringing crisis, something that threatens the core of your being, your very existence, and you have no power to make it go away. First thing I want you to notice tonight in your scripture in Isaiah chapter 36 is a disastrous dilemma. Isaiah chapter 36 verse 1 says, it came to pass. Sounds like a Christmas story, doesn't it? In the 14th year. That's all it says. So there's just no warning. In fact, if you read chapter 35, the preacher Isaiah is pronouncing a blessing on them. I mean, he just blesses, 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 and everybody's dancing and throwing flowers around, and God's good, glory, glory, glory. This is not the first time this has happened. 2 Kings 18 tells us that Sennacherib came with his father Sargon at that time. Hezekiah paid him tribute and bought him off. What's a lesson that we need to learn here? Even in the best of lives, a life-threatening crisis will come like an Assyrian invasion, and he will be coming to take your family. He'll be coming to take your wealth. He'll be coming to take the blessings of God. He'll be take it, coming to take the things you've worked for. He'll be coming to take the things that you're depending on. He's be coming to take your food, your health, your happiness, your life, everything. Everything, the devil wants it all because he wants to stand up and say, look at this child of God. God is either dead, he doesn't care, or he can't do anything about it. God is not faithful. He said, well, the devil would never be able to convince, wait a minute, he convinced one-third of the angels to leave heaven, didn't he? Do you think that you and I are any match for him? What is the source of the problem? Sennacherib was an idol-worshiping pagan king. He's an emissary of the devil. And therein lies your strength. This is not a battle between you and the world. This is a battle between the God of heaven and the God of, of this world, Satan. You need to learn right now where the battle lies and who the battle is with and what the weapons of warfare are. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the, for the destruction of fortresses. You say, oh, I... If I just be sweet to them, that'd be sweet, won't they? No. You can be sweet to demons all day long, and you won't change their nature. 
We are destroying speculations. That's a false philosophy. And every lofty thing, that's pride that raises up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This battle's in your mind. It's in your heart. It's in heaven. It's in hell. This battle is how you think, how you act, and how you react. Choose, the Bible says, choose your weapons carefully. Remember what I said. This is not the first time that uh, Hezekiah has been uh, threatened by Sennacherib. Before he bought him off, let me tell you something. You can't do business with the devil. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy, and you'll always have to pay him off. And tomorrow it'll be more, and tomorrow it'll be more, and tomorrow it'll be more. Mr. Satan, you need to start saying, I'm not ever going to give you any more of my business. Verse 1, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. That wasn't a pleasant time. The Assyrians were known to be the cruelest of the cruel. They would take people and skin them alive. They would kill your children before you and then put your eyes out and carry you off into slavery. They would put you into sexual slavery. They'd put you into impoverished slavery. They were a cruel, hateful group of people, a disastrous dilemma. Secondly, a deliberate decision. Are you listening? How many times does God give us information and we just miss it? How many times have I, 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 have I sat in the presence of people, looked at them and said, I've got a word for you right now, and this is what the Lord says. And, and, and when I got through, they'd say, have you, have you eaten that flounder down there at that restaurant lately? God speaking. And they want to talk about Fish. I remember my Uncle Sam. You know he was a preacher. Who cares? God is speaking. Be careful how you hear. Jesus says when we miss God, it's not because of a faulty word. It's because of faulty hearing. Talking about those disastrous times when something comes upon you suddenly and it's surprising in your life. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do in, 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 uh, when you're in ICU? What, what are you going to do when you're in the oncologist's office? What, what are you going to do when you're in prison? What, what are you going to do when you're facing the grim reaper? What are you going to do? Uh, it, Satan comes and he postures, he charms, he, and if that doesn't work, uh, he'll, he'll tell you that he'll help you, and if that doesn't work, he'll threaten you, and he'll lie to you. He'll lie to you about God, and he'll lie to God about you, and he'll say, God has sent me here, and this is all your fault, and, and and uh, that's what he said to Hezekiah. He said, uh, Sennacherib came and said, you know, God sent me up here to talk to you. And the reason he sent me up here to talk to you, he's got a problem with you because you took away all these high places and made people come down here to Jerusalem to worship, and you have offended God. He said that to him. He accused God to Hezekiah and he accused Hezekiah to God. Look at Isaiah 37, 1. I tell you what, this is getting, this is getting serious. Isaiah 37, 1. And I would say some of you that are listening right now are getting ready to go through some deep waters, but I'm not going to say that because I believe you're already in deep waters. The word of God came to he Hezekiah when he was in way over his head. He tried everything else, and it didn't work, and then he tried prayer. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. He covered himself with sackcloth and entered the house of the Lord. Now, honey, you got this problem. 
You, you need your rest. No, you don't. You need to start praying. You need your sleep. You need to take something so you can go to sleep. No, you don't. You need to sit up all night and, and pray. It won't make any difference if you miss a night's prayer, uh, sleep, but it'll make a difference if you miss praying to God. But now, now, we just want to make you comfortable. Hezekiah said, I don't want to be comfortable. I, I want to dress in sackcloth. I want to feel pain because my heart's in pain. And, 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 and when you do warfare, you're, you're not going to be comfortable. You're praying and you're praying. And, and, and the Bible calls it fasting. You don't eat and, and, you, and you might even miss work. And you, you might miss, miss some parties. You, you, oh, heavens to Murgatroyd, you, you might miss, miss a TV program. But you start praying. Listen, a pastor the highest time for everything is not usually worth very much when he gets there. You need to be praying. You need to be talking to God. Verse 2, he sent Eliakim, who was over the household with Shebna. Now, he sent the people in his household, the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth. He said, I, I want you guys to be praying too. To Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. He didn't send him to somebody, somebody uh, down the road. He didn't send him somewhere else. When you want a word from God, you better go to God's man and God's word and not somebody who's posturing. This is what they said. Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection. For children have come to birth. There's no strength to deliver. We've got this great opportunity, and we don't have a future. God doesn't come through. We don't have a future. Perhaps, now watch this. Perhaps the Lord, as Yahweh, that's his name, your God. You notice they didn't say Yahweh God, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh your God. The call on the prayer line, and they have no faith. They don't trust the Lord. They pay him lip service, but they don't trust him. They don't talk to him. They don't hear from him. They don't have a relationship with him. Perhaps the Lord, your God, will hear the words of Repshaka, whom his master, the king of Assyria, sent to reproach the living God. And will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer a prayer to the remnant that is left. Hezekiah went to the temple. Why? To get in touch with God. He went to Isaiah. Why? To get a word from God. What's the problem? They said to him, verse 3, right there it is. They said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this is a day of distress. Oh, we're, we're just, we're under the gun. But it's worse than that. It's a day of rebuke. We, we, we've been shamed. We're, we're powerless. We've got all this stress and we have no power and rejection. And, and we don't even know how to pray. For children have come to birth. and There is no strength to deliver. Isaiah, you've made all these promises back in chapter 35. And uh, I, I can't make those promises come to pass. I don't have any strength. I don't have any power. What am I going to do? When you hear bad news, I mean, when you hear the bad news, just remember, listen to me. If you don't get anything else out of this, remember this. When you hear bad news, just remember, God always has the last word. When you hear bad news, God's sitting up in heaven. He's listening to all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not what I think. It really doesn't make any difference what anybody else thinks, does it? See, God at Calvary, somebody thought, well, you know, Jesus is dead. God has finished speaking. And God said, no, there's one more word. It's called resurrection. 
And Peter betrayed Jesus. They said, well, he's out of here. He'll never preach another sermon. God says, oh, wait a minute. I've got the last word. When it took old Lazarus, put him in the grave, they said, it's over. And God said, oh, no, I've got the last word. When the Gadarean demoniac was taken and chained out in the tombs, they said, he's worthless and useless and we can't do anything with him. Uh, he, he said, well, we're going to just put him out there and get him away from us and, because he'll, he'll never amount to anything. And God says, oh, no, I've got the last word. When they took the boy and they were taking him down to the funeral and then they were going to bury him and he had died and, and there was a funeral procession and Jesus came that way they, and they said, he's dead, it's over with, it's over with. And Jesus, oh, no, 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 no. I always have the last word. And when the woman with the issue of blood had been to all the doctors and done all the stuff and she said, I'm not getting any better. In fact, I'm getting worse. Jesus said, oh, don't worry about that. I've got the last word when the cripple at the pool of Bethesda said I can't get in that water I can't I can't do it I just can't do it Jesus said don't worry about it I've got the last word and when the centurion's daughter was dead and he went to Jesus Jesus said oh I'm glad you came here because I've got the last word let me tell you something God's final word has not been spoken to you yet. Sennacherib speaks, where is God? We've conquered everybody. No, no God's been able to stand against us, Sennacherib says. They are powerful like your God, but we won. We're bigger than all your, those gods, and we're bigger than your gods. Egypt won't help you. Nobody loves you. You can't depend on others. You better surrender to us. Hezekiah won't help you. He, he, he said that God told him to do all that, but God, well, where are the gods of all these other people, he says. We're not afraid of God. He's subject to us. God has sent me to get you because I'm more powerful than God. And God said, wait a minute. You've crossed the line, boy. You have gone too far. You have blasphemed the God of heaven. Now it's no longer you against them. It's you against me. And I want you to know I'm against you. Look around. Personal righteousness is laughed at in our nation, in our churches. The God of heaven has made a mockery of in our nation in our courts, in our in our our assemblies, in our in our churches, we have all these uh, the fine problems in our lives, and somebody will get up on television and say, "Well, everything's just fine." It's not fine. It's time that God stood up and shook Himself and said to America, "You have blasphemed me." When you have a problem like that, what do you do? Take it to God. Come to church where the word of God is spoken. Where somebody tells you, thus says the Lord. And listen to what God says. Go to the oracle of God. Go to your Bible and, and listen to what God is going to say. There was a disastrous dilemma. There was a deliberate decision and there was a divine deliverance. Look at verse 21. God's about to speak. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent word to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. You know, a lot of times I, I, I about decide after reading that, I'm going to change, change my way of visiting the hospital and going to sick beds and things like that. I'm going to say, what have you prayed about? You know, you know, God's saying, all right, now, what, what do you pray? What do you believe God's going to do here? What, what's God told you? This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. You have blasphemed me, God says. I kept silent. You thought I, that you had won. You mocked me, but I was amused at your ravings. That's what God says to Sennacherib. I gave you this power, and you're no more than a puppet on a string. 
Because of your raging, verse 29, because of your raging against me and because your arrogance has come up to my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips. You're no more than a horse to me, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. And there will be peace. Look at verse 30. Then this shall be the sign for you, Israel. You will eat this year what grows of itself, and in the next year, that second year, that what springs from the same, and in the third year, so reap, plant vineyards. And the Bible says in verse 36, then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185. God didn't even do it himself. He sent an angel to do it. Struck 185,000 Assyrians in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, these all were dead. Wow. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. Oh, God's not through yet. And returned home and lived at Nineveh. And it came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nimrod, his God, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, killed him with the sword. And they escaped in the land of Ararat. And Ashadon, his son, became king in his place. Are you listening? The best way to see what God's going to do is to see what God's done. Oh, as an interesting sidelight, God did save the kingdom. Oh, by the way, later, the next chapter, Hezekiah gets sick and going to die. Once again, he sends for Isaiah. And he prayed, and God healed him and gave him 15 years of his life. And you know what he did with his life? He entertained Babylonians. The Assyrians that God kept out of Jerusalem, the next group, the Babylonians, he let them in. And, and, and by the way, his baby boy Manasseh became king. And he knew this story. He knew he could not live without the existence and the power of God. And you know what he did? He got mad at Isaiah because he didn't like what Isaiah was preaching. Isaiah dared to challenge his authority. And he sought him in two, cut him in two. And he killed the oracle of God. And he says, now, I don't have to listen to God anymore. But guess what? He's listening right now. Are you stifling the voice of God in your life? you saying, well, I, I, don't, I don't like what, what God's saying to me. Well, I want to live life on, on my terms. Or this, this, this is so boring. Or, boy, I love this one. Don't preach to me. Well, if God doesn't preach to you, who will? Scots have a story about a shepherd boy. He was watching sheep one day, and he noticed a flower. It's an unusual flower, and so he went over to look at it, and he picked it. And the whole side of the mountain opened up. And he looked in there, and there were treasures beyond his imagination. And he walked in and looked, and there was gold and rubies and diamonds and precious stones. And he began to fill his pocket, and the voice said, Don't forget the best. Well, what else could there be? And he looked around. There were diamonds and emeralds. And hurriedly, he, he filled his pocket with those. And the voice said, don't forget the best. And he picked up more treasure, more than he could really, really uh, uh, carry. And the voice said, don't forget the best. And he thought, well, what could there be the best? And the mountain started to close, and he began to run, and the voice continued to say, don't forget the best, don't forget the best, best. And he got out, and the mountain closed, and the voice said, you forgot. You forgot the flower. You forgot the best. And all the treasure turned to dust. Don't. Get the best. You're going to go through life. And there's going to be gold, and diamonds, and rubies, and all kinds of treasure come your way. 
But if you're going to forget the best, it'll all turn to dust. Because even the flowers of the field will fade away. But the word of God will stand. Pray with me. Thank you again for listening to a telecast of Challenge for Living. My prayer is that your faith has grown and that Jesus Christ is personal to you. And one of the things we do here at Challenge for Living, in fact, the main thing we do is we try to go throughout the entire world and tell people about Jesus Christ. And the way we do that is to go on mission trips where we go all over the world. Right now, we're building an orphanage in India attempting to reach thousands, thousands, millions for Jesus Christ that have been abandoned by their parents and by their government and by everyone. And so if you want to be a part of this, then I ask you to send us a donation at Challenge for Living, 7427 Matthews Mint Hill Road, Post Office Box 104, Suite 105, Mint Hill, North Carolina, 28227. You see that on your screen right there? I hope that you'll pray about this and become a part of what's going on as we reach the entire world for Jesus Christ.